Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mike Gormley Show. I happen to be Mike Gormley, so that's that works. Uh, we were just listening, coming back in with a, uh, a song called I Got You by Jake Miller. Um, and we went out into the commercial I mentioned uh, with a song that includes Wadi Wachtel on there. And he uh, is in the immediate family who we uh, we talked to a couple of guys from the immediate family not too long ago. Uh, I want to ask, I mean, you worked with the immediate family and you're in the documentary, right? Correct. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, you did the whole album with them as producer? Uh, I probably did, I don't know, 10 albums, maybe more. I don't know, 20. I mean, I worked with well, those. Not, not the immediate family. Well, maybe well, with the guys. But... Meaning four of the five. I mean, Russ Lee, Wadi, and and, and uh, Danny. I mean, oh, my yeah. God. I mean, Danny played on Kim Carnes' original album, Mistaken Identity, for me. That's great. Yeah, they go back a long way. That track is Danny's playing an acoustic guitar. Um, you know, I worked with Danny all those years, and plus Danny produced, you know, when you think about this, the kind of crew that Peter Asher had when we did JT, he had Danny, he had me, he had Russ. I mean, all these people have gone on to become successful producers on a major scale. Uh -huh. You know, Danny did, besides the album he did with... Um, you know, well, he did. He did uh, all the the uh, solo records with Henley, um, and they were all done in my studio. Well, two of them were in my studio in Sherman Oaks that I used to own, that I ultimately sold to uh, Dr. Dre because I got tired of the twenty employees and the fights over vacations and the rest of the nonsense. But the boss. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like. I make music for a living. I didn't. I originally built that studio record one because I wanted a place for me to work, and then everybody came in and wanted to work there. So then I started ending up booking time around town somewhere else. I mean, it was crazy, you know. Yeah, and I'm suspecting that because of the professionalism involved in the immediate family, that it was relatively easy. Is that true? Or was it because, or, or given the the talent, it may have been maybe a little more difficult. You tell me. Oh no, everybody in that band, in, including Steve Fustel, who I haven't worked with much, but um, but Danny and and Russ and Lee, I've worked with a ton, and Wadi. Uh, you know, they're they're all easy people to work with. I mean, they're they're great great players and the consummate studio guy. You know, they contribute everything they can to the arrangement, to the feel, to the production, anything they can do to help, they do. And they're all so talented that they all help. <laughs> yeah, so it was easier. Yeah. Steve Postel, that's put, that, that group's put a little bit of a spotlight on him, which he's deserved for a long time. Yeah. He's and, a great, great. Excellent guitarist, great songwriter. Just one of those guys that, Along the way, didn't uh, I mean he was he was always working. I don't mean to make it sound like that, but he wasn't. He never never seemed to get the critical acclaim that the other four guys did. But you know he's a very talented guy. I love Steve, and and he's a great player. And yeah, you know, but he's a decade or more behind them, so he kind of grew up watching them. You yeah, know? yeah. He so was probably, probably a little dizzy by the fact that who he was working with. Yeah. But that's great. It's it's great to have him get that notoriety. And but they're all so busy that the immediate family doesn't play very often. Not much because you know Waddy's out constantly with Stevie and Russ and Lee are you know uh, they go out with um, what's the guy's name? Uh, can't think of his name now. But you know they all work all the time. And Danny just recently bought a house in the East Coast, so he's back oh. there. All right. Well, hopefully they'll be they'll be on stage somewhere fairly soon. This is an excellent band. To yeah. Here. Um, so they always say they're the best cover band in the world. You're in the documentary. You're in their documentary. Yeah. But what, they what, did you happen to be in the studio that day or what? No, they came to my house and shot everything here. Oh, yeah. Brought the whole film crew over to my house, to my studio. 
True. And, and you just told a story. I haven't seen that yet. Danny asked me the questions that he wanted answered, and I tried answering them. Yeah, cool. He cut and edited and put it in different parts of the film, but I must be in the film 10 times, you know? I want to I want to go back to look in the different sort of categories of your life where you started as a music what well, you started as a medical <laughs> a medical student but as as a musician uh, an engineer where's the break between engineer and producer was it a segue or did you just decide you wanted to do production Well I was doing you know huge huge records as an engineer and I wanted to move into production because that's always something that I kind of had done all my life anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's like a natural progression for me. And my friend Frankie Rand, who was the head of Epic Records here on the West Coast, called me up and said, uh, would you like to produce Randy Meisner's solo record? And I thought, man, that's a great opportunity. And Randy's a great voice because I met Randy when he first moved here from Kansas when he first started. And so... We got together and we did a solo record and the first single was a was a big hit called Hearts on Fire. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the beginning of my production side. That's uh we're we're coming up to a a break again in a little while, and we're going to go into the commercial break with only the lonely, the motels. Um that was a band that was Playing around LA, uh, was it was it a and R guy who decided to put you guys together, or how how did that come about? It was an interesting story. <clears throat> um, Martha was probably playing most of the time at that time at Madame Wong's down in Chinatown, which is kind of where she, uh, Carter discovered her and signed her to Capitol. She made two albums for Capitol that were very critically acclaimed, but commercially not very successful. It probably sold maybe 30,000 copies between the two records. Mm. So um, I was sitting in Jim Maz's office at EMI America because that's where, you know, I, I was making, I made the record Betty Davis Eyes for him and and that label. And he said to me one day, he said, have you ever heard the band, the motels? And I said, sure, they're great. And in honesty, I'd never heard a note. And so he said, why don't you, uh, meet with Martha Davis and maybe you could produce them. So he set up a meeting with Martha and she came to record one and was in my office. And the first thing she said to me is, why do I want to make a record with somebody who does Linda Ronstadt records? Cause she was in a punk band, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I said to her, look, Martha, it's music. <laughs> and I said, you can do any kind you want. So I did a whole album with her. Uh, and her boyfriend at the time, who was the lead guitarist in the band, and he kind of forced me to do it the way he wanted, and I didn't get to have much input, so I did it, and we turned it into Capital, and they said, uh, we we love the band, but we don't love this record. Would you consider redoing it? So she came to me the next day and said, they want us to redo it, and I said, well, you got two choices. I said, you can hire, fire me and hire somebody else, or if we do it, I want to do it with the way I want to do it. And she said, okay. So we went in the studio and I hired three studio musicians and used her bass player. And we proceeded to record the, the all for one record. And it had a big hit at Only the Lonely. And then the next album took about a year to get the song. And that was suddenly last summer. Yeah. I, I, uh, I know they came out of the whole LA punk scene, but those records, in my opinion, aren't punk records those are but she she has stated <laughs> in interviews in years since that you know i kind of changed her life and not for the better she wanted to be a punk band but oh, yeah you know I, it's, a, it's a go go story they thought that they were a punk band and and didn't even like their first album because it was so, so pop yeah yeah and, well that you know, I mean, it was a pop hit, but it was an inter it's a dark record, you know, all in the lonely. It's a dark subject matter. Yeah. yeah. You know, she's a dark person in terms of her performer, which to me is part of the charm of who Martha Davis is, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
I think we're up to a break and we're going to listen to only the lonely or a portion of it from the motels. Excellent. Right. Did it hit number one or certainly top 10, right? Right inside the top 10 and got to number eight, I think. That's still very good. Oh, yeah. I was... All right. This is the Mike Gormley Show. We're listening to Only the Lonely. We're going to be back in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Oh, we're coming back.